Hi guys, Ms. Peterson here, and welcome to AP Physics 2, Lecture 8-7-2. So it should say 7. Lecture 7-2, all about the development of atomic theory. We're going to be going through the story of how we discovered what matter was made of and what atoms are. Um, from the cathode ray that gave us the plum pudding model of the atom to the Rutherford gold foil experiment into the Bohr model connecting in the de Broglie wavelength and talking about the Schrodinger model of the atom and wave functions. So let's go ahead and get started. Basically, pre-1900s, the current modern like theory of the atom was Dalton's atomic theory. He was the first one to write up something that went beyond the earth, wind, fire, air type of theories. Um, and he got a lot right, okay? He was the one who came up with the word atoms coming up from the letter atomos, which means indivisible. Um, he said that all atoms are of a given element are identical. Now, we know that that is not necessarily true anymore. Uh, we have what's called isotopes of different elements. Um, but the atoms of a given element are different from atoms of any other moment. They differ in their number of protons, okay? Atoms of one element can combine with atoms of other element to form compounds, okay? And he said that they were indivisible in chemical processes, uh, which is typically true. Chemical reactions just change the way the atoms are grouped together. But in this course, we will be focusing mo mostly on nuclear reactions, which are reactions in which the actual nucleus of an atom changes. But we haven't even discovered the nucleus yet, so let's keep going to J.J. Thompson and his cathode ray tubes. So this is the experiment that led to this current model of the atom where you have negative electrons surrounded by a sea of positive charge. Okay, so little tiny particles called electrons in the atom which is overall Neutral, so there must be some positive stuff in the middle. And this is typically called the plum pudding model of the atom. Okay. Now let me go ahead and show you how this experiment worked. Okay. So this is a general cathode ray tube. Over on this side, uh, we have the accelerating voltage. Okay, we can see what's going on over there. And then here we have an electric and a magnetic field. And what Thompson would do is he would control the voltages and control the magnetic field strengths in order to get the uh, particle or the cathode ray, which he didn't know what it was, Okay, he just knew that he could produce this by having a high voltage source and producing electricity to get this ray. He wanted to know what that ray was made of. And he was able to control this ray and make it go straight. So what can he determine about the ray from that? Okay. Just to put this into context, this is in the early 1900s, so we have Newtonian mechanics, we do have special relativity. Also, electromagnetism has been solved completely. Well, Maxwell's equations for electromagnetism have been um, known. We know the speed of light, but we don't know what these cathode rays are made of. But we do know about the forces. So, if we are picturing the ray coming out of here, and going through here, it could go straight through, it could go up, it could go down, okay? And that's all governed by the electric and magnetic forces, which it's not showing the electric one here, so I'm going to go ahead and add that to the diagram. It will have an area with a negative and positive charge, okay? So we have that area where the ray is produced, typically that accelerating voltage, and then here we have the ray is controlled by those electric fields and magnetic fields. So if we're thinking about the forces on this ray, we have the electric force and the magnetic force, okay? And we know, um, we can know that voltage, 
But what could we determine about the electron? Okay, what could we actually determine from this ray? Okay. Well, they could definitely determine the sign of the charge on the ray. Okay, they could definitely determine that sign just by how it interacted with those electric and magnetic fields. But then if you're trying to think about how that ray is being controlled, well, that's related to its acceleration or that net force divided by its mass. If we're doing electric and magnetic, we have Q uh, for the magnetic. So what is the equation? Oh, review of electrostatics. Electric force. Is it just Fe? Yep, Fe equals Qe plus the magnetic force, QVB, knowing that these will be in opposite directions, divided by M. Now, we would know this, we would know this, we would know this. But we haven't discovered the electron yet, so we don't know Q and we don't know M. The only thing that he was able to determine in this experiment was the charge to mass ratio of that ray. He was not able to determine the actual charge or mass of the electron, just that they existed because they were coming off of these metal plates, okay? They knew that it was smaller than those atoms and were able to determine that charge to mass ratio. And then came Millikan. So let me go ahead and show you what they basically did. Keep on doing it. So in this oil drop one, they sprayed a bunch of oils until they were able to get one that levitated, okay, that returned in between these two high voltage plates, okay, and they would look at all of these levitating particles, and they could control that voltage, okay, and change the voltage and change the masses of those that levitated by that electric force and the gravitational force on that small oil drop. Now, he did this with tons and tons of tiny oil droplets. Tiny, charged droplets. And he was able to get them to levitate. Okay, the force, the electric force on them balanced out that force of gravity. Okay, if they suspend, then he knows that those forces are equal. But how does that help him determine the charge? Can it help him determine the charge of the electron? Yes. Okay. They did this thousands and thousands and thousands of times. And they looked at the, the least or the, sorry, the greatest common factor. No, least common factor. Yep, that's what I mean to say. The least common factor between all of these charged droplets. Okay, we discovered that electrons exist. So by looking at the charge mass ratios of all of these different oil drops that have different masses, that have been charged to different amounts, they were able to look at that charge mass ratio. And they were able to get the mass of those oil droplets and figure all that out. Okay. Cool. So now we're good on the electrons. And we have a model of the atom that looks like this, this plum pudding model, where we have these little negative electrons in there, that's what those are showing, and an alpha particle. We knew alpha particles were big, heavy nucleuses. We knew they were positively charged, and that's about kind of it, or big, heavy things that were positively charged, and that's about it that we knew at this point. And what Rutherford did is he fired uh, these alpha particles at a sheet of gold foil. You can see it a little bit clearer in... Okay, so 
This is generally how it worked. They had that radioactive source, which shot up the beam of alpha particles, add a sheet of gold foil, and then looked at where those particles hit the screen. Now, if we only had the uh, plum pudding model, what we would expect is all of the alpha particles to just run straight on through. None of them would be deflected because they are so massive compared to those electrons that it's kind of like firing a paintball gun at a sheet of tissue paper, okay? It's not really going to happen. But instead, what they saw was that some electrons went off at different angles. And if we zoom in a little bit more here, okay, basically, as those electrons, as those alpha particles came close enough to that gold nucleus to be repelled by it, we got some deflection angles. Now, the atom is mostly empty space. The nucleus is small. So most electrons just go straight on through. But some of them are deflected at these big angles, almost back toward the detector. And that led them to determine that there must be something massive at the center of atoms. There must be something massive causing these to deflect. Okay, so the plum pudding model would predict that all alpha particles would go straight through. But since some of them were deflected back at these crazy angles, we know that they were hitting something, that there is a dense, positively charged nucleus at the center of the atom with all of the little small electrons around it. Okay. So it changed the picture of the atom because it added the nucleus, okay? The mass of the atom the po and the positive charge is concentrated in the center, not spread out everywhere like in the plum pudding model. Okay, cool. Okay, cool. Now, most of those particles have been discovered. There was also the neutron, but it's a smaller story, not really brought up a lot, until we get to Bohr. Now, Bohr was awesome, okay? What Bohr was looking at was he was looking at atomic absorption and emission spectra. Basically, if an electron jumps down an energy level, it can emit a photon with energy equal to the change in energy of the electron equals the energy of that emitted photon, okay? And we knew about atomic absorption spectra and emission spectra. We knew that if we had an electron like there, we could shine a light on it and make it jump up to another energy level, okay? Okay, so let's look at some atomic emission spectra. Here I have a gas tube connected to a high voltage source. When I turn this on, what this is going to do is send electricity through the hydrogen gas that is in this tube. That electricity will energize the electrons and allow them to make those jumps between energy levels, producing the light that we see. Okay, so that is what pure hydrogen looks like when it's illuminated. Now, we're gonna look at it through the diffraction glasses, okay? As a reminder, they split the light into its component wavelengths. And I have fitted my camera with one of them, so I'm gonna go ahead and put that on. Okay, and as a reminder, this is what white light looks like through those diffraction glasses, okay? So we can get that full spectrum. It's a continuous spectrum of all of the colors of light. And these are the glasses, so they diffract it in all directions, okay? Unlike a diffraction grating, which normally just does horizontal. 
So let's go ahead and look at the hydrogen. Okay, and I'm going to hold up this black piece of paper here so we can get a cleaner spectrum view of it. Okay, we can see that prominent red line and that prominent blue line. The camera is not quite good enough to pick up the two purple lines that you would see like if we were live in the classroom um, or had a better diffraction, but we can definitely see those blue and red lines. Now these are characteristic of hydrogen, that hydrogen gas. Now, if I switch this out for helium, okay, here, I have helium. Okay. For math worked perfectly for hydrogen. And then you got to helium. Okay. We can see its spectra. And what do you guys notice? Okay. Yeah, there's still, we still got that orange line. Looks like maybe I see two orange lines. I do still see that blue line. There's a couple of other prominent ones. Basically, helium has two, has two electrons and two protons, which made it way more complicated than hydrogen, and the math just didn't work. As we continue to go up from helium to argon, to, uh, from helium to argon, argon, another gas in that noble gas family, convenient for these because they don't react. Okay. We can see argon spectrum. It's a little dim, those purple ones to see, but there's a lot more of those continuous lines in the red and blue ranges. Let's go ahead and look at two nitrogen, which is actually N2. Now, nitrogen gas is a molecule, meaning it has tons more electrons and protons and complexity to it. So when we look at its spectrum, Okay, it's more similar to that white light. We're seeing more of that continuous band, but it is more discrete lines. There's just a lot more of them. And that's atomic emission spectra. Okay, cool. Okay, cool. We hadn't quite gotten this idea of these quantized orbitals. Bohr discovered that. And Bohr was actually able to come up with an equation. Um, in one form, it's delta E equals negative RH, which I believe is 13.6 uh, electron volts for hydrogen, uh, times 1 over the energy level that it started in squared minus 1 over the second energy level squared, where these ends are integers of the energy levels, okay? N equals one, two, three, et cetera, okay? So it uh, solved and it predicted atomic absorption and emission spectra. Bohr was able to relate the energy of the light that it absorbed or emitted to the spectrum of light that we see. And he explained that those uh, photons were emitted or absorbed, you know, if you're talking about emission or absorption, due to electrons moving between discrete energy levels. Okay, and that was awesome. He was like, score, we can predict how atoms behave. And it was awesome, okay? He had an equation. He could predict these lines in the spectrum correspond to these energy level transitions in the hydrogen atom. <coughs> um, he tried to add another proton, make it a helium atom. Math didn't work. Um, he tried adding mother electrons. The math didn't work. The math only worked for a hydrogen atom. And it was based on the assumption that if the electrons were in the same orbit, 
Um, they do not emit the radiation, which is not necessarily true. Uh, they all emit radiation, black body radiation. And it did predict the frequencies really well of the emitted photoelectrons, but not that intensity of the light. Okay, And this was our first kind of clue that maybe the energy of a light wave is something other than the energy of a um, of like a mechanical wave. Okay. And we need to look at this Bohr model a little th more thoroughly. This one is still used in a lot of practices. Uh, intro chemistry students still draw these. Um, it's a great, easy to understand model of the atom that can capture and predict many, many behaviors uh, of atoms. Okay. Let's look a little deeper at it then. Okay. So when I was talking about those emission spectra, Here's what it looks like for hydrogen. So if you uh, have seen those gas tubes uh, and then you turn them on and put on diffraction grading glasses, you can see the lines uh, that it emits. I should throw in a demonstration of that. I'll throw in a demonstration of that. Um, but he was able to predict all of the different transitions, okay? And electrons can move all over. So there's one series where it jumps up, and then it can jump up and down and up. There's another series starting at the second energy level, and the passion series, which is electrons that start at the third energy level. Okay, And we see, oh yeah, it was that 13.6. Now, this equation is the energy of the photon. It's written as HV. It should be HF. Okay, that change in energy is equal to the change in energy of the electron that is moving around in the atom. Okay, so for example, according to the energy level diagram shown above, okay, so this one right here, this is an energy level diagram, you'll see lots of them. What is the wavelength of light needed to cause an electron to jump from the ground state, that is going to be the n equals 1 state, uh, to the third energy level, n equals 3? So if we're at n equals 1, we are at an energy of 0 electron volts. Okay, At n equals 3, according to this diagram, we're at an energy of 12.1 electron volts. Normally you'll see this in the reverse, uh, more similar to electrostatic potential energy where you'll have negative electron volts moving towards zero being the um, ionized or completely outside the atom one. But um, it works, the math is the same either way. So we have a change in energy of 12.1 electron volts. So how much, what wavelength of light? Well, Energy of a photon of light equals HF, or we're looking for wavelength, so we'll use it in HC over lambda, okay? So that change in energy will equal the energy of that photon that it needs to absorb. So HC over lambda, and HC in this case, we will do it in the electron volt and nanometer form of it. Uh, so we'll get the wavelength in nanometers. So we have 1.24 times at 10 to the third electron volt nanometers. So do the math, move it over. We have that divided by 12.1, which gives us 102 nanometers. Okay, cool. Okay, cool. And we could have also gotten that uh, change in energy level, that 12.1, from using this equation. Okay, we could have done 1 over n2, the low one squared. So 1 over n2 squared, it was 1, so 1 over 1, minus 1 over 3 squared, so 1 over 9, gives us 0.8888 times 13.6, and we get that 12.1 electron volts of energy, okay? This is the context that you'll see it most likely in the AP Physics 2 curriculum, though every now and then they will give you that equation and have you use it. It's not on the equation sheet, so it's not when you're expected. 
it's not on the equation sheet, so it's not one you're expected to know, but it does come up. Okay. Now, along with the Bohr model, a concept comes up called the de Broglie wavelength. Now, de Broglie was looking at wave particle duality and bo the Bohr model and trying to figure out how these electrons were behaving. So, he was able to prove and show that the orbitals, the discrete energy level orbitals in that Bohr model corresponded to the wavelengths of the electron that would need to be created in order for there to be a standing wave, okay? A standing wave of probability. So, for example, if uh, n times the wavelength of that electron is uh, equal to the circumference, then it would be allowed. Where if it's not equal, then the electron can't exist in that state. And that's what leads to those discrete quantum energy levels because they have to be integers of the wavelength and create those standing waves. Okay. Um, we will be coming back to this equation later, but the equation to find the de Broglie wavelength of a particle is, zoop, 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 it's on our equation sheet, wavelength equals h over p, okay, where this wavelength is the de Broglie wavelength, h is of course Planck's constant, and p is the momentum of an object, okay? This also helps explain how things like photons and light can have momentum and exert a force on something, even though they don't have mass. Um, and just remember that momentum equals mass times velocity. Okay, so if based on this equation, Okay, long wavelengths of light show lots of wave behavior and a little bit of particle behavior, or not based on the equation, just application, where short wavelengths of light show lots of particle behavior and less wave behavior. So let me kind of make sense of what that works if we find the wavelength of a baseball. Okay, now the wavelength of a baseball would equal Planck's constant, uh, H over MV. So we have Planck's constant. Uh, since I have kilograms and meters per second, I'm going to use Planck's constant in joules. Uh, so 663 times 10 to the negative 34 joule seconds divided by the mass 0 0.15 kilograms times the speed 40.0 meters per second. Okay. We plug that into our calculator, and we get 1.1 times 10 to the negative 34 meters, okay? And it is meters. If you remember, a joule is energy, so M, I always remember it as um, kinetic energy, mv squared, where we have the kilograms meters squared per second squared. So this seconds cancels out with that second squared. This meters per second can cancel out with that, uh, this meters per second and leave, or sorry, this seconds leaving one meter left there and kilograms and kilograms cancel out. So we get that in meters. Okay. So the wavelength of that baseball is 1.1 times 10 to the negative 34 meters. That is um, smaller than everything pretty much. Um, we don't really know if we can have lengths down to that small. You can check that scale of the universe simulation. Um, but in order to see the wave, um, in order to see wave behavior, the baseball would need to go through or like diffract through to diffract through an opening that's around that order of magnitude, so around 10 to the negative 34 
order of magnitude. Uh, that would a baseball fit through there? No. Of about the same magnitude. And uh, it can't fit. So we will never see the wave behavior of a baseball. Even if it's going really, 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 really fast close to the speed of light, then maybe it could have a wavelength that we could measure and detect. Um, but when it's that small, you're just not really going to see it. Yep. Okay, let's do this problem. This one is a little bit bigger of a problem. We got some review of electrostatics. Okay. We have electrons in a diffraction experiment are accelerated through a potential difference of 200 volts. What is the de Broglie wavelength of these electrons? Okay, so uh, we want to find its de Broglie wavelength, which is wavelength equals h over mv. I do know the mass of an electron, um, and I can probably figure out how fast they're going. Okay, how do we figure out how fast they're going? Well we know that they are accelerated through that potential difference. So the change in potential energy of the electron will equal its change in kinetic energy. So we have um, QE, or, or Q, um, QV, okay, energy, Q delta V, right? Double check my formula real quick. Yep, Q delta V equals one half mv squared. So go ahead and do a little algebra, move the two over there, divide by the mass, and take the square root of it. So to find the velocity of those electrons, it'll be the square root of two times their charge, uh, which is 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 uh, coulombs times that voltage, 200 volts, or joules per coulomb, divided by their mass, which is 9.11 times 10 to the negative 31 kilograms. Okay, so when we do that math out, we get 7... Point zero times 10 to the 13 meters per second. And I'm just going to double check that real quick. I didn't get the same answer. I got 8.4 times 10 to the 6th. Uh-oh. Let me double check my math again. Make sure I got my charges right. Yep. Boop. Boop. Okay. Ah. Uh, I forgot to take the square root the first time. The correct answer is 8.38 times 10 to the 6th meters per second. So if we wanted to calculate the wavelength of those electrons, okay, we already got our equation over there, so let me go ahead and move it over here. Wavelength equals H over mv. So we have H, which is a Planck's constant, uh, 6.63 times 10 to the negative 34 joules seconds divided by the mass of the electron, 9.11 times 10 to the negative 31 kilograms times that speed, 8.38 times 10 to the 6th. We get a wavelength of... Eight point 
six eight times ten to the negative eleven meters, which is like eight hundred and sixty eight nanometers, right? Nanometers is times ten. To, oh no, it would be even smaller than that. Um, yep. Uh, but that is on the order of picometers. That is pretty small. Electrons could definitely fit through a slit of that size. So we do see the wave behavior of electrons. Okay. Uh, what about a proton? Who had that momentum? What would be its wavelength? This one is just a straightforward problem. Wavelength equals H over P. P being the momentum. So... Whenever you're working with momentum in kilograms and meters per second, you do have to use Planck's constant in joules to make the units match up. Okay, joules, remember, are kilograms and meters and seconds. So make sure you're watching your units and not accidentally using the electron volt uh, version of Planck's constant or anything like that. But when we plug it into our calculator, we get uh, 2 times 10 to the negative 11 meters. Okay, cool. Okay, cool. So that's the Bohr model. Okay, Bohr model, de Broglie wavelength. Okay, what is our current model? Okay, so our current model of matter is called the standard model. Everything that we've talked about so far, protons, neutrons, electrons, all fall in this part of the standard model. Protons are composed of up and down quarks, and then atoms also have electrons. So that's all matter, okay? Then we also have the force carriers, the interactions. These are what cause the forces, okay? The Higgs is the source of the force of gravity, okay? Photons that carry the electromagnetic force. Gluons hold together the nucleus and are the nuclear strong force, okay? Photons, like I said, are the electromagnetic force, the um, force carriers of that. And they are those, you know, electric and magnetic forces. All have to do with those photons. The nuclear weak force, uh, this also helps hold the nucleus together. And I believe it's actually the one that holds the up and down, the actual... Um, protons and neutrons together, like internally. Yep. And then we have gravity. Okay, gravity is our long-range force, and it is the Higgs boson that you might have heard about that does that. It was predicted for a long time and then finally discovered pretty recently. Um, in our current model of matter, each of those particles is described by its wave function, okay, by a probability, okay. So the current model of the atom, um, if you want to kind of draw a little picture of it, would just be that, and then we have the dense nucleus, and then a cloud of probability around it, okay. Um, now, we have big equations to describe this probability called wave functions. If the wave function is zero, that means the particle will never be there, okay? So in this example, the particle will never be at a distance of 1.2-ish meters, or I think that's like 2.9 meters. And it'll be most likely to be wherever it has a higher amplitude. And it doesn't matter whether that amplitude is positive or negative. So for example, in this wave function, we would be most likely to find that particle at a distance of 2 meters away. Okay. And that is actually how we describe the positions of electrons in atoms. Okay, cool. So, hopefully you got a good story of Dalton's atomic theory through the Schrodinger wave function probability model that is the standard model. Okay, cool. Okay, cool.